welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 117, and it's an introduction, and I want to stress it's only an introduction to the colonization of Ireland, the conquest of Ireland. There's so much more that needs to be researched and written on this subject and so much more research that I want to do. But I also wanted to get you starting to think about this subject because it's not really one that you see written about a lot. And it was a major part of English foreign policy, especially during the later Elizabethan period, especially as war with Spain became much more of a threat and the religious differences really came to the fore. So Ireland was really important and we don't really tend to think about it quite so much and about what was happening in Ireland during this period. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. (laughs) But first, I want to thank my patrons. I have amazing patrons, and it has been a while since I've done a little patron shout out. So here we go. So I am so incredibly grateful to Ashley, to Rebecca from Tudor's Dynasty, to Janine, to Andrea, Elizabeth, Berta, Melissa, Char, Amy, Al, Twyla, John, Sarah, Vicky, Kathy, Christine, Cynthia, LaRonda, Jurgen, that's my dad, <laughs> Philip, Katie, Kara, Catherine, Sabrina, Shandor, Ian, Slane, Megan, Susan, Kathy, Lady Anne, aka Jessica, Donna, Michelle, Judy, Kendra, Joanne, Emma, Jim, Annetta, that's my mom, Mara, Barbara, Kiva, and Cynthia, that's my mother-in-law. So you see, only three of you are family to me. Oh, and my stepmom's in there too. So only four of you are family to me. (laughs) And yet I have this amazing community of patrons. And I have to tell you, when I read those names, it just fills me with such gratitude. And I'm just so appreciative of all of you for being so supportive of this podcast and of this show. I'm going to be 10 years old this year, you guys, and I could not do that without your support. So thank you so much. And if you would like to become a member of this exclusive group of very intelligent people, only four of which are my family, (laughs) you can become a patron for as little as a dollar an episode. You can go to patreon.com slash englandcast, patreon.com slash englandcast. Cool. All right. So let's talk about Ireland. Early on in Henry VII's reign, the monarchs in Tudor England were worried that the Yorkists who had been beaten would go to Ireland to stage a resurgence. This is much the way Henry himself had been welcomed in Brittany and planned his invasion from there. So the Tudors thought that if they were going to successfully rule in England, they had to subdue Ireland. And so during the 16th century, they worked hard to extend the administrative central power of the English crown. They also wanted to expand their trading networks, and they saw an opportunity in Ireland to try to broaden their commercial horizons. But this wasn't the first time that England went into Ireland and got involved in the Irish affairs. The English had been involved since the time of the Norman conquest. And in fact, the first conquest of Ireland from the Anglo-Normans was under Henry II in the 12th century. And at this point, the Irish were seen as barbarians that needed to be civilized, which is, of course, a playbook out of a page out of the playbook of any invading country. Uh, whenever a country goes off to colonize and take land from people who are already there, they often justify that in their head by saying, oh, they were uncivilized, or they needed to have religion brought to them, or, you know, any number of things. And then you cut to a Monty Python movie where they say, what have the Romans ever done for us? Oh, they brought peace. Sorry, if you don't know Monty Python, you really should. I'm not sure what what you need to evaluate your life choices. That diverged. Okay, so the Anglo-Norman influence was fairly strong, especially around Dublin, until the Black Plague. So after the mid-1300s, 1348 and thereon, many left leaving this power vacuum where the regional where the regional clans and the regional kings came back. This was power structure similarly to or similar to what England had seen in the 800s and the 900s before England became centralized, you know, Alfred the Great and all that. And I am not an expert in this. I would refer you to the History of England podcast 
also an Agora member or the British History Podcast if you want to actually dig deeper into that. But you know, during this period, before England became united, there were regional kings and you know, there was the Kingdom of Northumbria and the Kingdom of Mercia and Wessex and um, East A- East Anglia, that was a a kingdom. So, you know, there were all these kind of regional kingdoms. And that's what we have in Ireland at this time then too. These regional kingdoms where people would pay a tribute, usually in cattle, to their overlords. The overlords would wind up paying to the regional kings, and then everybody would be protected back on down, right? So that's what was going on in Ireland at this time. And the area around Dublin, though, did have some English influence. It was similar. It was called the English Pale, much like they called the the Calais, the Pale and Calais, uh, that you know, ostensibly had some English influence, but it was sort of um, a, a frontier area and it was really unstable. So despite the fact that it had been bustling with Anglo-Normans until the 14th century, the English had just backed off until the end of the 15th century. And what happened then was two different pretenders to the English throne under Henry VII sailed from Ireland, supported by Irish lords. So that brought about this concerted attempt in the 16th century to subdue the lords of Ireland and unite them under the control of the centralized rule of the Tudors. It's interesting because often when you look at what actually came out of the Tudor period, one of the main things that often comes up is the the centralization of the state and the paperwork and the bureaucracy and all that kind of stuff. And this is an example where we see that being exported to Ireland. At the edge of the pale, there was this frontier, beyond which was the land ruled by the Gaelic warlords and their followers. Henry VIII first tried to subdue Ireland by making himself Lord of Ireland. He also tried to make the church Protestant, he sent soldiers, but he also put friends in high places and tried to rule through the leaders that were already there. So Henry wanted to bring about an administration and central government, and he introduced a policy called surrender and regrant. So the Irish would agree to give up their land to Henry, and then in return, Henry would give it back, provided that they followed English laws and recognized him as the Lord of Ireland, that they would speak English and follow English customs. And many Irish took him up on the offer, but there were a lot that would just kind of agree. And then as time went on, they would just be like, what? Like, what did I agree to? I don't know, Henry. Who's Henry? I don't know, Henry. So it was really expensive for the Tudors to try to be ruling this land, right? Instead, they invested their time and their money into supporting the warlords who were friendly towards the English. And the main one was the Fitzgerald clan of Kildare. Now, this is a policy that many countries still try to do today, leading to mixed results, uh, where you go in and instead of just taking over, you try to get, and there's a whole debate about whether or not that's smart, but then you, instead of just taking over, you get a, a group that's sympathetic to you, that has power and have them kind of rule through you, right? That's all really great until it turns on you. And that's what happened with Henry. So the Lord of Kildare was the Lord Deputy of Ireland, despite the fact that he was a political enemy of the Tudors, but it was cheaper for the Tudors to use him to rule Ireland for as long as possible. And that was the policy until 1534, when it all went bad. And that's when the Fitzgeralds got fed up with being the king's deputies and the rebellion of Silken Thomas happened. Silken Thomas believed an untrue report that his father had been executed in London. So he rebelled. He took a Kildare stronghold and he killed even those ones who surrendered. He just rebelled like crazy. And this was a turning point as the English struggled to reassert their authority in Dublin and in Ireland. From there on out, the English colonization of Ireland, also called the Conquest, Uh, depending on whose side you are and you're on and where your loyalties lie. Conquest, colonization, changed methods back and forth, going from sending armies, which usually ended in disaster for England, to trying to work with the local families, which also had mixed results. So as Henry moved England away from the Catholic Church and imposed the Reformation on even reluctant Englishmen by seizing church lands and punishing nobles, he didn't actually have that infrastructure in Ireland. And so Ireland remained Catholic. And this is something that, you know, still, when you think about how do these decisions still affect us today, if you look at what happens in Ireland and the struggles. And again, I'm not an Irish expert, but a lot of that comes from the religious tensions. And that directly is related to the way the Reformation spread in Europe during the 16th century. So after Henry, Queen Mary, despite still being Catholic, she still wanted to rule Ireland. So it was Mary who actually introduced the first English plantations in Ireland. The idea was she wanted to plant English and English supporting families in Ireland, where over time, they would grow and increase the support for England. So the idea was, you know, send a family here and a family there. And pretty soon, they'll have lots of children, and there'll be lots of people who support England, and they'll kind of weed out the ones who don't. And that's a nice idea. 
Um, she wanted to plant two counties, she said, but very few people went as they were all too afraid. So Elizabeth came to the throne then determined to subdue Ireland once and for all. And that's where we start to really see a lot of the action and a lot of the people who were very famous Elizabethan adventurers got their start in Ireland. In 1581, John Derrick wrote The Image of Ireland. He dedicated it to Sir Philip Sidney's father, Henry Sidney, who had led several victorious armies over the Irish. This book contained wood cuttings showing the victories and denigrating the traditional Irish culture. Again, nothing particularly new in that. The woodcuts showed clans fighting against each other in ways that were seen as backwards and tribal. In many ways, Ireland was still ruled through these relationships between the Lord and his subjects, like we talked about. There were formal relationships, but there wasn't the central administrative arm and the English saw that as a lack of progress. There were key families in each province who controlled the system. And like we said, the largest had been the Fitzgeralds and the Butlers of Ormond. And it's been said that between these two, with their allies on each side, there was kind of this two-party government system in Ireland between these two great families. But again, nothing central. So when Henry Sidney was Lord Deputy, he had to leave Dublin to subdue the Irish rebels many times. He would always try diplomacy first, but then he would rush the rebellions militarily, setting up up this pattern of rebellion followed by submission. Another famous deputy was Humphrey Gilbert. He was the Queen's deputy in Ireland during the 1570s. He believed in complete submission. If any Irish rebelled against him, he would decapitate an entire village, even women and children. And supposedly he lined the path to his tent with severed heads. And he used to make the relatives of said victims walk along the path to provoke great terror in them, which... I can imagine. I actually, I can't imagine. Um, so yeah, imagine if you were the son of a rebel or, you know, and you had to walk down this path where your relatives' heads were all. It's pretty gory stuff. But it wasn't just the English. Even the Irish lords would kill fellow Irish to prove their loyalty to the queen. Thomas Butler was the 10th Earl of Ormond, and he supported the queen. He actually built his house in the English style. He added it onto an existing castle and, you know, looking very Tudor. And Thomas Butler had been brought up at the English court. He was cousins with Elizabeth, and he took great pride in that. And he butchered thousands of fellow Irish in an effort to show her how loyal he was. You actually still see the names that he sent in lists to the queen. They're, they're in the archives. So you can see these lists. I killed this group. I killed that group. This is how loyal I am to you. So this then is the period where Elizabeth is a Protestant and branded as a heretic. The great fear was that a Catholic monarch from the continent was going to support the Irish rebels. Ireland was seen as the staging ground through which you could reach England easily. So if there was room for a, a foreign country to come in and take it, England had to keep that from happening, right? In 1580, James Fitzgerald Fitzmorris of the House of Desmond landed in Southwest Ireland, accompanied by a combined Italian and Spanish force of 600 men, as well as a papal nuncio. They asked all the Catholic Irish men to join them in a crusade for Christian Catholic rule against the heresy of the English. Edmund Spencer, the poet, and Walter Raleigh were among the troops sent to intercept them. The forces were trapped and besieged, and they were faced with the English artillery. And they put down their arms, and they surrendered, and they were all killed. Again, this was like the pattern. The Spanish would support the rebels because they supported the religious part and saw it as this religious crusade against Protestantism. They saw Ireland as the back door to England. So this Desmond Rebellion lasted for several years. It's remembered in English literature because of the writings of Edmund Spencer. Spencer was in favor as well of a scorched earth policy against Ireland. He wrote about the Irish in ways similar to the way the English would write about the Native Americans. They were barbarians and capable of being governed. He thought their language should be completely eradicated, believing that if children learned Irish before English, their hearts would be Irish and then there was no saving them. He writes that during the Desmond Rebellion, out of every corner of the wood and glens, they came creeping forth upon their hands, for their legs could not bear them. They looked anatomous of death. They spoke like ghosts, crying out of their graves. They did eat of the carrions, happy where they could find them, yea, and one another soon after, insomuch as the very carcasses they had spared not to scrape out of their graves. And if they found a plot of watercresses or shamrocks, there they flocked as to a feast. In a short space, there were none almost left. 
and a most populous and plentiful country suddenly left void of man or beast, yet sure in all that war there perished not many by the sword, but all by extremity of famine they themselves had wrought. Pretty harsh. The Desmond lands were confiscated by the English, and the land was opened up for plantations for the English. Raleigh and other adventurers bought large estates, and this is actually when the first potatoes to be grown in Ireland were planted. They were brought over from the Americas. So Raleigh then sold his estates and concentrated more on America, but again, you have these plantations springing up. The province of Ulster was the last part of Ireland to be captured by the English. It was dominated by the O'Neill clan. Their chief during Elizabeth's time was Hugh O'Neill. He had been educated in England as a nobleman. The queen thought so well of him that he was actually allowed to keep a standing army of 600 men. He had fought with the English adventurers like Raleigh, and so he was trained in the English methods of war. But then, as soon as it came to threaten his own territory, he turned. As the English encroached closer and closer to his land, he felt he had no choice but to rebel. And so in 1593 and 94, he began training his army for war. Now, he had been clever and rotated that 600 standing army in and out through the years so that when he decided to rebel, he actually had a much larger army available to him right away. At one stage, he had close to 30,000 men under arms in Ulster, many of which were Scots who had come over as well. The front line was the Blackwater River, where the English had built forts on the south side to threaten the O'Neills in Ulster. But the forts had to be constantly refortified. They became a drain on the resources of England. On August 14th, 1588, 4,000 men went to relieve one of the forts that had been under attack. Their column was ambushed, and nearly half the men were killed, with the rest retreating and abandoning their weapons. This was the Battle of Yellow Fort, the most decisive victory over the English in Ireland. O'Neill's power grew. He kept moving and and gaining more land, and he he grew to have almost all of Ireland, but he couldn't get Dublin. Whoever held Dublin held Ireland, and he couldn't attack because it was a walled city and he didn't have the siege equipment. The port of Dublin was always going to be a line of communication back to England. So he tried another tactic. He decided to become blatantly pious, and that was a way to appeal to the Pope. He linked Catholicism with Irish patriotism and Irish identity, The English saw this as a cynical ploy for foreign aid. And there's actually a story that when the Earl of Essex met O'Neill during a peace negotiation, he made a comment about how O'Neill likely cared more for his horse than for religion. But Pope Clement VIII named him the Captain General of the Catholic Army in Ireland. And O'Neill hoped that the Spanish were going to come to his aid, and he appealed to Philip II to send aid to him in Northern Ireland. But in 1601, the Spanish came and they got lost and they wound up coming to Southern Ireland in County Cork, a close to a town called Kinsale. The English response was to lay siege to the town. The Spanish were trying to fortify it, getting it ready. And so Lord Mountjoy of the English, they came and laid siege. It was December at this point, O'Neill's moving south through the winter, coming, trying to come and meet Philip and they're moving their armies south. And at one point then, Mountjoy, the Lord Deputy, found that he was surrounded because he had the Irish coming from the one side and then the Spanish on the other, and he was kind of in the middle, sandwiched. On Christmas Eve 1601, the Irish moved towards the English lines. They were hoping to take them by surprise, but the English were watching, and there were apparently a lot of tactical errors and issues. It was a hot mess and became a military fiasco. One of the main takeaways that people talk about is that the English saw what was going on. They used the cavalry to break up the Irish, and they had stirrups. And that meant that they could charge faster and the stirrups would take the weight if they got knocked. So they weren't going to fall off the back of their horses, whereas the Irish had shorter horses, they didn't have stirrups. And a lot of people say this whole battle was lost by the Irish because of the lack of stirrups. So that's interesting. So Mountjoy used the cavalry, broke up the Irish, stirrups or not, and shortly after, The Spanish then surrendered as well. The English conquest over Ireland, over the Gaelic tribes at this point, was pretty much complete. Mountjoy laid waste to O'Neill's land in Ulster. They shattered the stone upon which generations of O'Neill's had been crowned. Hugh O'Neill surrendered, 
He was allowed to keep some of his land, and though it was obvious his power had been destroyed. Eventually, these Irish nobles left Ulster for Europe. Hugh O'Neill died nine years later, an exile in Rome, apparently still talking about his dream of going back and capturing his land from the English. So that is going to be it for this week on this very brief introduction to the English in Ireland. But I think it's interesting because during this period, we talk a lot about you know the English going to the Americas and colonizing the Americas. And a very similar thing was happening in Ireland. And for a lot of these adventures, that was kind of their proving ground or their their practice before they went to America. And I don't know, it's, I think it's kind of interesting. So <laughs> the book recommendation is Elizabeth I in Ireland by Brendan Kane and Valerie McGowan Doyle. There are also movies and films on YouTube. I've lift, listed some of them in the show notes on englandcast.com. So you can go there and grab all the different notes and links and everything like that. Okay. So let me know if you enjoyed this episode, if you want to know more about Ireland, and you can get in touch with me through the listener support line at 8016 Tesco, through Twitter at Tesco. You can go to the Facebook group, facebook.com slash England cast, or you can look for the Tudor history group that I run on Facebook as well. It actually came out of the Tudor summit. You can go to facebook.com slash groups slash the Tudor group. You can check out everything that we're doing there. There's a lot of discussion, a lot of stuff happening. So come and join the community and hang out with me online. Okay. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you so much for listening. And I will be back again in another couple of weeks. (laughs) Talk to you then. Blow northern wind, a sandful baby sweating. Blow northern wind, blow, blow, blow. Ich hoort a board in Bauerbrick, that soul is Samly's on sick. Men's cool maiden of me, fair and freight of fond. In all this war, flesh of one, board of blood and of bone, never yet in Houston on, not so mad in London. Blow northern wind, send for maybe sweating. Blow northern wind.